Hi everyone, my name is Lisa. I'm a cosplayer and graphic designer and today we are going to look at foam, all about foam. We're going to uh, have a look at the different types of foam, why we might use foam to make our costumes and props and I'm going to show you some techniques that you can uh, use on your phone to make some pretty cool stuff and then I'm going to take you through a step-by-step -step of making a vambrace not this particular one but we're going to um, build one up and I'm going to show you how we go from patterning to finishing and you will be able to play along at home and design your own or base it on a character that exists using some of the techniques that I show you today so I hope you enjoy this workshop and let's get started on making stuff with foam hooray So when we're talking about using foam to build our armor pieces and our props, we're talking about um, EVA foam typically, not the upholstery foam, though you can use upholstery foam to build things like mascots or muscle suits, but you can't do anything that we're going to be learning today with that foam because it's what we call an open cell foam. It's like a, a big sponge with really big holes in it. The foam that we're talking about today is our closed cell foam. And the one that you're probably most feel familiar with is going to be your craft foam sheets and also um, your camping mats. And they come in like the big packs of four that most of us utilize because we didn't have any other source of foam for um, quite some time. Now we have a lot more options available, which is really cool. Um, but we're going to be using basic craft foam today and I'm going to use a mixture of one millimeter foam. And we're also going to use this three millimeter foam. If you're building props, you're going to use something a little bit thicker. So you've got like a five millimeter foam and you've also got your high density foam and it comes in even bigger thicknesses than this. Um, and these are very good. Um, this is a high density foam that's very firm. So that's a really good one to build your props out of so that it's got a little bit more structure to it. You can also get these really cool things. They're like noodles of foam that have got bevels in them already which saves you a heap of time of having to make your own custom edge details like we had to back in the day before this was available um, so this was actually bought for a commission piece that i am building um, and that will save me a lot of time in making one myself but you can still do it yourself if you are so inclined um, and the other type of foam that we're going to look at is uh, the foam clay it's an air clay um, and it dries very, very light. You can see it's very boingy. And you can sculpt with it and you can also use molds with it. So I will show you what we're gonna do with that. So a few things moving forward with foam. It is made of some pretty harsh chemicals. So I do highly recommend that when you're utilizing some of these tools that you're wearing appropriate PPE. So if you're using um, heating at all um, on some of the uh, fumes that you get from the adhesives and the paint, I would rec uh, recommend using a respirator like this. This is a particulate as well as a vapor respirator. When you're sanding this stuff, it creates a very fine dust and you will inhale it and you will end up with it up your nose. Um, so it is really important that you're wearing this and in particular when you're heating it with something like a, a hot knife, um, like a wood burning tool, you want to have a mask on for that, particularly as you'll be leaning over the piece to etch your details in. Um, and you'll also want to use this for using any of your spray paints and um, some of the primers that are in a spray formula, you definitely want to be using that as well. The other thing that I also recommend for your PPE is getting yourselves just some safety glasses. We are also obviously going to be using our sharp implements and most of us have cut ourselves at some point and if you're like me, I am very clumsy. Um, so you'll be working with those. You're also going to be working with a heat gun and again most of us have burnt ourselves. It's often because we've put it down and then accidentally bumped it with our arms so please do be careful with that. Um, if you're doing a lot of heat forming um, with either the foam or a thermoplastic that we often use to coat to cover the foam. It gets very hot, so you may want to get yourself some gloves. So you may be wondering, but Lisa, why are we using foam? Particularly for something for armor. That seems counterintuitive because foam is soft and squishy. Let me tell you. So most of us that have joined the CosFam and have built cosplays, it can be a very expensive hobby. Um, and those builds can sometimes be very expensive. So where we can, we want to reduce our costs as much as possible. 
So the material is very accessible and is very cheap to get compared to some of the other materials that are available. It also doesn't require very many specialized tools. Most of the tools that you need, you can get at a hardware store. The foam sheets, you can get either the craft foam packs, they come in an A5, A4, they did come in an A3, but I don't know if they're still available, but they were handy for patterning. These you can get at like places like Spotlight. Um, and you also have your high density foams that are really good for your um, props because it's a firmer foam. Um, it doesn't have as many um, heat forming capabilities as some of your other foams, but it is very good for stuff like this. Anything bigger than this though, I would still recommend putting an armature in the, in the middle and it's usually like a, a dowel or something and it just stops it from getting floppy. You don't want a floppy knife. You can layer your foam to create some really cool shapes. So it makes it look like you're pretty fancy when it's a very simple technique. One of the other things that we really like about foam is its heat forming capabilities. It is one of its strengths and it allows you to do some pretty cool stuff. So it can be heated and um, formed into a shape. You can create a lot of curves with it and you can also exaggerate those curves by using darts just like you would with fabric. And when you put those pieces together, it's going to exaggerate those curves. I tend to use it, that technique, when I need to have a curve that the material doesn't particularly like doing because you're making it curve in multiple directions at once, which can be a little bit hard for some fabric, uh, some materials to do. Foam, you can use things to help shape it, which is why I have some weird stuff on the side here and I will show you um, when we get into that part. All right, so I'm going to show you some of the tools that you will need. Some of them are optional, some of them you're just going to need <laughs> to get you started. And then there are more tools that if you decide that you want to continue your COS journey um, and do more work, they're ones that I would highly recommend because they make your life a lot easier. So first up, because we're working with foam, we're probably wanting to do nice curves, so you're going to need a heat gun. I do not recommend using a hairdryer. You burn your hair dryer out for one, um, but it doesn't really get hot enough to do most of what we need to do. So just get yourself a heat gun. You can get these at hardware stores. They're pretty cheap. They're probably even cheaper than a hair dryer. Um, so just get this one. This one has like an adjustable temperature. I don't tend to change it very much with the material that I'm working with. Um, please be careful again when you're using these. I think they do come in different tips. I just generally have it with this just as is and it does the trick. Um, you want to be careful when you're working with foam that you don't burn it and I will show you the difference but get yourself a heat gun you will need it to do your foaming. You're going to need um, again it's, it is a highly recommended tool it is not one that is necessary um, but it does make your life a lot easier and gives you um, more opportunity to do fancier things and that is a rotary tool. This I have a Dremel it is a particular brand of rotary tool. It is quite expensive, um, potentially compared to some of the other ones, but it comes just as this part with the attachment here. I do recommend, particularly if you've got small hands like mine, I have like little baby sausage hands. <laughs> so I personally like the attachment part. This just gives you a little bit more movement and freedom to do your finer details, and it makes um, it a little bit easier on yourself um, and a little less fatiguing than holding up this part of it. Um, so a rotary tool is highly recommended. The parts that I use the most for foam is mostly my drum um, sand bit. It comes in different sizes. It comes in that size and it comes in a larger one like this. I keep the ones that start to wear out as well because they lose their grit and then you can um, smooth your foam a little bit more. When you're using a more coarse um, grit sand paper on a foam, it's gonna make it a little bit fuzzy. Some of that fuzziness will come off when, like it'll melt when you heat it again. Um, but I do recommend these ones. Um, some other cosplayers have used um, these stone tools that come with the Dremel. I don't use them very much, but you could do, um, like they'd be good for doing like your um, indentations if you want a, a, like a hammered metal look for like Skyrim and that sort of thing. Um, and some people prefer that for sanding. I just use that. Um, but that also does like you can get engraving tips that'll give you a little bit more freedom. Um, but you can use the Dremel to not only sand your pieces, but you can also create like little fake rivets by using this part of it and you sort of drop and stuff. 
it is the life we live now. Um, and you would just go and it creates like a nice little rivet. Um, and you can create also like texture in it um, with the Dremel piece as well. So very handy, very highly recommend, not just for foam, for other stuff too. Um, and it will be your lifesaver. So invest in a good one um, because it is worth it because you won't go through them as quickly um, because you can burn them out <laughs> if you use, use them a lot. Obviously you are going to need cutting implements. Get yourself a good Stanley knife. Um, you can use ones, I probably, depending on the foam, I have a, I have a, um, it's like a bandsaw. So I use that for doing a lot of my cutting because it's just easier. Um, and now I have the laser cutter that can do stuff for me um, because I find my hands just have some issues cutting. Um, so I would recommend getting the one that's got the longer blades in it if you're cutting through thick foam because that won't penetrate all the way through. But you get yourself um, a good scan knife, get yourself a good craft knife. And I also recommend getting yourself a sharpening tool or like a steel or something like that foam blunts your blade like nothing else and it is far more economical um, to sharpen between than just replacing a blade because you're replacing it every time you use it otherwise so just get yourself a blade um, a sharpening tool and you will save yourself some grief um, and then you can also get obviously different types of craft knife points um, this one's a very pointed one compared to this one depends on the detail that you're doing um, but that will help you get those details in so those are kind of I would say they're a must-have. These are your definites, get them. You can't really do foam work without them. Get yourself a metal ruler. The reason we use a metal ruler is because if you use a plastic ruler, you're probably gonna cut nicks into it, like I do. Um, so when you're running your blade along it, if you're using a plastic one, it's really easy to like whoop. Um, when you're cutting it as well, depending on your handedness, I'm right-handed, I cut on the right side of the ruler because if I slip my line's always going to be against the ruler um, rather than trying to do it this way and then you're having to keep it's just weird yeah <laughs> make your life a little bit easier for you when you're cutting handy tip brought to you for free um, and this is another optional one not necessary you can get these um, again at uh, craft stores it is a wood burning tool the wood burning tool is really good in getting some of that extra detail. Um, you can create those grooves in it. There's different types of, it comes with like different head bits. I don't know what they're called, um, that you can create some cool techniques with. Um, very important. Having the right adhesive is, the, it's the thing that's gonna make life so much easier for you. It's also gonna help the durability of your costume. Um, and also depending on the type of shapes that you want to create out of the foam, you need to have a good bond for it to do that. If your adhesive isn't strong enough, it is just going to crack and it's just going to pull away. So when I first started, I used glue gun. Um, it's not great for doing seams. It's very messy. I will show you, it will ooze out of your seams. Um, it's good if you want to create, like if you're doing fallout and you want to make it look like it's welded together, really cool for that effect. And you can also add other effects by, it's kind of like a dimensional effect. You can make like blobby rivets, um, patterns on top. Um, but in terms of actually sealing your pieces together, joining your pieces together, it's not the most ideal, but it is also really good in a pinch. So if something fails, <laughs> um, as it always inevitably will, the glue gun is your saver. <laughs> it will fix stuff that it needs to. Um, but this is what you will need in attaching your pieces. So one of the things that you'll need to think about when you're building your costume is how is it coming together? How is it actually sitting on your body? Um, and how is it staying there? <laughs> That's the tricky part. And I can find that for myself was a bit of the trickier part in developing. I could find lots of resources on building a thing, but not how to put it onto my body. So I will show you a couple of tricks for that too. So that is kind of necessary because of the way that we're attaching the material um, to the foam to attach it. You need to have that. Super glue is good for small details, but I don't recommend using it for bonding, um, especially large areas. You're gonna go through it really quickly, but also super glue um, dries more brittle. So it's just gonna crack, particularly because we're often using foam for its flexibility. This isn't flexible at all. <laughs> it is just going to crack. 
Um, and it's also really messy. Um, and I had some glue explode on me yesterday while I was gluing some stuff because of the way that you have to puncture it. And that was when I have it all on my hands and it doesn't come off very easily. So please be careful with super glue. Also, pro tip, again, I learned the hard way. Do not use super glue if you're gonna be reheating the foam. If you put super glue on a seam or you're adding a detail and then you're heating it again, you're gonna create vapor and it will sting your eyeballs. So don't do that. Um, use this for adding your small little detail parts, um, not for big areas and once you've already heat formed, do that after because it'll hurt. The most important glue that you'll need is your contact adhesive. This isn't specifically the one that I usually use, but lockdown life is making life difficult and it's the one that I could get. Um, it's not as a strong bond as the one that I usually use. It's like that shoe glue, um, like the leather glue that you've seen, it's that yellowy, amber colored, gloopy stuff. And you might've seen the meme with the old guy trying to transfer it and it's all sticky. That's your contact adhesive. It's very good at what it does, um, but you do need to get the one that's right for the material. Um, most of them are good. You just want to make sure this one I think is not as strong contact because it's made for flat vertical or something. I don't know. It's just not the one that I normally get, <laughs> but it will work. Um, it just doesn't work as well. And I found this doesn't work as well on one type of foam compared to other. So on the high density foam, it wasn't as good compared to on your uh, floor mat foam. This is one that I decided to try out because it was at the supermarket and as I said, we're living in the times where you can't just duck down to the shops and grab something. So I thought this might be worth having a go. And also I like the fact that it's in a tube. Um, it does work relatively well. Again, it didn't work as well on the high density foam. That's the gray one. Um, I don't know why, it just didn't like it as much. Um, this one works very quickly compared to this one, um, but it is also a handy one. So the way that these contact adhesive work is that you put it onto the two surfaces, you wait for it to go tacky before you attach it. If you attach it straight away, the way that it cures or dries or something, um, it won't work properly if it's not exposed. So you generally apply it to the two surfaces, wait for it to harden and go tacky, but not too long, because once it's not tacky anymore, it doesn't self adhere, um, which I found with this one has a very short time compared to the other ones. Um, but your contact adhesive is very good. Um, the one that is quite a good brand, but I'm gonna give you a pro tip. So there's a brand called Sika, S-I-K-A, that you can get at Bunnings. You might've heard um, American cosplayers refer to barge. We don't really have barge over here and because of the regulations, um, with shipping this particular type of adhesive because the chemicals in it, you probably won't find it very easily. Um, but the Sika brand is pretty similar, but it comes in not a pot like this, it comes with a lid. You can also get a spray contact adhesive. That is very handy. It's not handy for um, things that are gonna be under pressure like your the belt piece, for example, but it is what I use to attach this top piece here. So this is a top piece of foam, which looks like this. And it's being bonded onto this. Obviously different size, I was doing a test. Um, so when you're using that, I actually used a spray on contact adhesive, um, same brand, just in a spray bottle. Um, and it worked very well for this because it's a nice flat area. Um, if it's under tension, it may not work as well, but it works on the same principle, you spray, each side, you let it go tacky, and then you combine it. Also, pro tip, if you're doing a flat surface like this, particularly where it needs to be aligned, don't necessarily spray the whole thing first, because once you attach the two surfaces together, they are never coming apart again unless you cut them apart. So, yeah. I like to re like, align things first before I stick them down. And when I did this piece, um, I did one side one way and one side the other way. So I actually did adhesive just to this front part because this was the important part that I needed to line up. And then down here, once everything there was lined up, I sprayed that part. So the spray adhesive works fairly effectively for stuff like that. So they're the basic tools that you're gonna need for today, for the, what I'm showing you. All you're gonna need is some um, craft foam, some thicker craft foam going to need your cutting blades. I'm going to be using a Dremel. I'm going to also be using the foam clay. 
I've already got a mold that um, I purchased um, that I've worked very well for the idea that I had but you can also make your own molds that will work if you decide to do um, sculpting with your foam clay you can get some um, tools these are fancy tools these are shapers they've got a silicon tip these are also other clay um, sculpting tools um, but you can use something as simple as like a skewer I think this is like an orange stick that you use for your nails and you can use that so you can get by with very basic stuff pretty easy all good to go so let's get started with showing some techniques all right so first up I'm going to show you the heat forming capabilities of foam so I've just cut out some shapes of foam here I cut out some circles I'm gonna bring this super fancy tool it's very exclusive it's just a drink bottle and this is they're like measuring cups <laughs> um, I just like the surface it'll make sense in a sec trust me it's not weird so when you are hitting foam you are going to be heating both sides of it is my recommendation that way the the temperature is distributed evenly and you're going to get a more even um, heat form shape um, and when you form it as well I tend to exaggerate the shape that I'm making because it will tend to spring back a little bit depending on the type of foam that you use some may flatten more than others um, which is why sometimes putting the thermoplastic on top can help um, but for these work pretty well they hold shape relatively well but I'll show you what I mean when you're heating it you don't want to be heating it in the one spot you'll burn it it will you'll know it's burnt because it goes yucky it goes really dark the other thing I'm going to show you about heat forming is that we use it to seal the foam before we uh, start priming it when you heat it it sort of melts the surface cells and they shrink it will go like a shiny uh, texture um, and that is good we want that so even if you're not heat forming it and you're just attaching pieces together um, you would still want to heat form uh, sorry heat seal before you start doing your next priming process don't burn yourself take my form so I'm going to use this one you have to work relatively quickly before it starts to cool. And I'm just using this as essentially like a bucket to form the curve over. You can use your kneecaps depending on the size that you need. But it's stretching the foam into shape to get a really nice curve. You can also use like metal mixing bowls. I've seen people use um, small bowls and then you're heating the foam in there and kind of pushing it into place one of the other things to be mindful of is that if you've carved details into the foam if you heat it those details tend to be lost as the foam remelts and softens Obviously, we keep working a little bit more, and you can see that now, like that would make a good kneecap armor, um, not a kneecap. Nice curve, it's gone from this to this. Oh. So, that's one thing that you can do. I'm going to show you curving it. Same principle. Yeah, for the fingies. Any small pieces are going to fly away as soon as you heat them, so you want to have something to hold on to. <laughs> tend to exaggerate the curve go further than what you want it to be finished because it will bounce back a little bit. And there's a curve. 
So you could make, I would probably not use this thick, but you could use um, a craft foam. You just wouldn't heat it as long so it doesn't burn. But you make your finger pieces out of that. You get the nice curve in it. Um, I mean, most of your armor is going to have a curve because it fits over a body, but that's a really easy way to do that. It's a nice gentle curve. And I'll take my fancy pair of scissors and push it on it. And you can see it's left like a little indent. So you can take like aluminium foil, or this heat gun makes it very hot. <laughs> do it in somewhere where you've got some ventilation. Um, so you can put like aluminium foil to create like a rough texture, or you can make like a mold out of something to make it look like it's simulating like a texture sheet that you push onto it once it's warmed and will hold that texture. But if I reheat it, it will disappear. So in some ways good, because if you mess up, you can salvage it. In some ways bad, because if you need to reheat it, you might lose some of that texture. In that case, you would heat it from the back and not from the front, because you'll just lose everything. But that's that, and I'll show you on a smaller curve with my trusty drink bottle. So this I made um, as a commission piece for Circe's uh, pauldrons for her coronation piece. It was a very intricate design. So I made the base pieces were out of foam, so it was uh, a thicker piece than this. This was my pattern. Then I had, yeah, so thicker piece, not quite as thick as that. Then a layer of another craft foam layer on top, which had the etched details, which I have. Oh. Here to show you I made a mistake <laughs> and it was not a good mistake because um, I had to hand cut all these details but this is a nice learning lesson for you instead so you can see that I've laid it so you've got a base piece so it's like a three millimeter base piece of foam that's been attached with another piece don't do what I did I figured out as soon as I did I knew what I did wrong put your pieces together flat and then curve it um, because I tried to attach it and like I said once you attach that contact adhesive it will not come off but by layering you can create these details for this particular one because again it was for a client so I actually uh, used a thermoplastic on top and I pushed it into the details that I cut out but it's something as simple as foam because it's your foam base that you're building that's what gave it the, the shape so because I'm doing a shoulder, so the pauldron essentially had to go this way. It had a curve that went down the shoulder and then also had like a little lip here. That lip is what's the challenge because you could do a shoulder pauldron relatively easy like that. But the challenge comes into the, the rest of the shape. So you're making your darts and this will come down to your adhesive. So you apply your adhesive onto the surfaces. This stuff's really messy too, so I recommend having something to clean up. Um, I use like whoop, lollipop sticks. Lollipop, yeah, icicle sticks. Not lollipop. Um, and pieces of foam work very effectively. And you just use it to like smudge the foam, sorry, the adhesive over the edges. You don't want too much either because it's too thick a layer and it won't cure properly or, hot or whatever it does, whatever magic. This stuff is quite stinky so I also recommend doing this somewhere where it is ventilated. I'm in a stuffy room with a heat gun and it's just making me very hot. 
you want to clean up the steam like you want to have the least amount of goop everywhere because it's more for you to clean up later um, that's also especially true if you use hot glue so we'll show you what happens when you join pieces together using hot glue it's a little gooby and then you've got to clean it up I'm just waiting for it to go tacky. Now, as I said, this isn't the greatest glue and I haven't used it very much. So we're going to see if it works and if it doesn't work, it's on camera. Now I haven't used registration marks in this, but it is something that I will make reference to. Registration marks are kind of like when you look at a fabric pattern and they have like little notches in them so that you know where to line everything up. That is a very useful tip, especially when you're doing foam, because if you don't line them up just right and you misalign it, you, you're probably not going to get it undone. So generally you would do little, I just do like little lines. I'll show you a pattern after this. So you can see, already starting to make a curve. There you go. And then I curved the end up, I think, may have made a dart at the end, I can't remember. But that is like your pollen shape. This is made out of craft foam, so it's not a particularly, uh, I wouldn't really use it out of, I wouldn't make a pollen out of straight up craft foam like this. It's not really sturdy enough, but it is a good way to do a um, proof of concept. So if you're wanting to double check that your pattern is working or that your idea will work, I will do what's called a, a proof of concept. It's like a mock-up basically. You're just going to do it in something that isn't your expensive material um, and you're going to just double check that everything fits properly. The, um, the idea that you have in mind of how you want to construct it works and that's it. Nice and easy. This particular type of contact adhesive. So this one you're going to need something to open it. Probably don't use a sharp implement. And don't bend your good material, but your good tools. So this one's clear. It's not the one that I normally use. It is still very pungent, so I still recommend doing this in a ventilated area. It's the same principle as the smaller tube. You don't need a lot, and you want to try not to drip it everywhere. So again, you apply it to the surface. I'm going to do one side with this contact adhesive and then I'm going to do the other side with hot glue so that you can do see a comparison. If I was using the top side, I would pay more attention to getting this level than this side because you probably won't see it. Like if you're making a belt or a shorter piece or literally anything, you're going to focus on the seam that's going to be visible because that's the one that you would have to do the work to clean it up. There is one piece joined. I'm going to...
you have a very short working time with hot glue as well because it'll cool and once it's cool you got it you can reheat it um, but you don't have very long working time with it so you can see where it's goo bit I didn't put very much on and it still oozed because it's cooled already I could clean it but the bond isn't as good that one's still not fully cured yet but the bond is generally better as I said this isn't the normal adhesive that I use and I think it takes a little bit longer for that bond to work but this once it's cool it's not going to change bond it's going to stay the same amount of bonding um, to it but if you wanted to do um, like a weld scene then that would be a very effective tool or if you're in a pinch and you just need to quickly fix something you can see how it oozes so then you would use the tip to smush it all along but this can help reinforce seams as well so on the inside part if you're not 100% sure if something's actually going to stay I would reinforce the inside seam it just gives you that extra bit of security remembering as well that you can build the foam onto literally any surface so I've built a uh, it was from Destiny cosplay um, it was a, a warlock and he had a shoulder piece um, that was attached to another part of his costume um, and I just used webbing regular webbing that you get um, and shaped up the foam and attached it to that webbing um, which is a nice you can see like there's a gap so that means that you've got a lot more cleanup and if I did it to that side it's going to look like that which is bleh. but it is a good way to reinforce any seams that you're a bit iffy about um, or if they're under a lot of tension um, and strain it's always good to reinforce it you can also add a piece of fabric and um, attach that in the same manner um, or you could use like the contact adhesive then reinforce the um, edges as well. I would just be like triple reinforcing because it's better safe than sorry. There is a repair station at PAX um, and at most cosplay uh, conventions now as well, but um, it's always nice not having stuff fall apart. Um, but often we don't have enough time to get our um, stuff finished before a convention to do a proper test fit. So inevitably something always goes wrong. Um, so they're the two different adhesives. As I said, the contact adhesive is the best one to use. It is what I highly recommend, depending on what it is that you're making. Um, the hot glue is very messy. Also be careful, because if you touch that, as soon as it's come out of the thing, you're gonna burn yourself and it will hurt. Um, and then I would have to go and clean up that seam and you would use something like this. This again, you can get this at the supermarket, it's just to no know more gaps. This one isn't sandable though, so you have to be careful in how you apply it. You would apply a very small amount. Let's see if it works. So you're going to take your no more gaps and you're going to put a very small amount in if it works. And then you're going to take a You want to take something that's got a um, an edge on it because you're going to push it into that seam. You want to have the least amount of cleanup possible, so you don't want too much going on the outside part. You want it going into that gap. That's a pretty big gap, so you'd have a lot of work. But because you can't sand it. Um, you're just going to make more work for yourself cleaning up because you'd have to put a lot of prime layers on that's essentially how it works and then what you can do this thing doesn't go on very well is a little bit of water and you can blend it And that way you've got less work to clean up. Still pretty gappy, but I'd be here forever showing you that you get the idea. So 
So you can also create some really interesting shapes using bevels and just little fancy cuts. They're not that fancy. All they are are creating little valleys or rifts that you then either will adhere closed with glue or you adhere open with glue to create that. So all you're doing is you can either use a craft knife or you can use the Dremel and you using the edge part to cut into it or you could use your hot knife as well. So all you're doing is making a cut on an angle. So you've got to make sure your blade's nice and sharp and don't cut your fingers off and you're going to create a cut on an angle and being careful not to cut all the way through. The width and depth of that bevel valley area will also determine how shallow or steep that little bend will be. So that one's quite a small one. In comparison, you got bigger. And then you would glue that closed. And you can see here, I've done the same thing. It's got a big area and I filled it with the hot glue and that will keep it open to create that shape. Probably even push it a little bit further and layer up my glue. Be careful because a lot of glue like that is going to be very hot and you will hurt yourself if you touch it. You can get blisters, so please be careful. And then you let that cool. You can preheat your foam as well if it needs just a little bit more encouragement. And it can help retain that shape. And then you've got some fancy little edges. So that'd be good if you had like a raised area that you wanted as a single piece rather than pieces that you're gluing together to make a little box. You can use it for like uh, shin guards. Your shin guards can have shapes like that as well. Um, and I've done a similar type of thing here on this knee guard where it has these shapes here and see the cuts that have been uh, glued, closed to help give you just that nice little bit of detailing that you wouldn't really be able to do any other way apart from making separate pieces that you glue together. So that gives you that really nice fancy shape and it's pretty easy to do. You can also cut your bevels. So cutting your bevel is again, same thing as we did there. You're cutting at an angle. You're either gonna cut this way or this way. Or if you fancy and you've got like a bandsaw, you can change the angle on your bandsaw and push it through that way. That's a nice quick way to do it. But otherwise you're just creating <clears throat> a shape. Depending on the steepness that you cut at, there are also some tools that you can get that will help you do that. I believe you just set the angle and you run it across. My blade's starting to get a little bit blunt, so that's where we take our sharpener and we give it a sharpen if I know where I put it. Somewhere, it's under the mess. We'll come back to it. So that is those fancy little shapes. Very easy to do, but it looks really nice. Um, and imagine that like one painted up as well going to really help and you could add the highlights um, to really accentuate so it's fancy create little spikes this one's probably a little thick or you would deepen up those grooves or you could get your dremel and just um, shave off that bit there just to give you a little bit more but you could do a spike like that remember that because I'm going to show you with the piece that I've going to do for our van brace. The next thing that I'm going to show you is using the Dremel. Now the best thing to do is go slow. And I don't mean go slow, slow by going slow speed. I mean go, you're not going too hard too fast because you can't put back what you've taken it off because you'd have to rebuild it essentially either using like a um, the foam, the moldable clay foam um, or you would have to stick pieces on. So go slow and you will get there 
until you get that confidence of working with it. So I'm using the smaller Dremel bit. If you have like larger areas, so for example, if I was Dremeling this edge, I would be using this drum because otherwise you'll be there forever. But if you're doing small areas in here, I'm gonna use this drum. So I'm gonna demonstrate before I do it on here. So this is how you get nice clean edges, but go slow. The other thing to be mindful of is that this is a rotary and it spins in one direction. If you're handling small pieces in particular, they're going to go flying while, you, while you're doing it. Trust me, I've, I've lost pieces. I think I did Rocket Raccoon's little toe claws out of um, foam that I just carved into shape um, because I wanted them to have a bit of flexibility because they were attached to socks that I walked around in um, rather than something rigid. And so carving them, they often went flying out of my hand. So just so you're fair warning. So that just gives you an idea of what you can create using just that one bit. So you can create little rivet like points with just the tip of it. You can give little gouges. You can create um, battle worn. So if you're doing um, a weapon or a piece of armor and you want it to look like it's being dinged up, you would just do it that way. Um, and you can also do like little smaller detailing. And as I said, you can get smaller um, parts for this that will do like engraving and stuff. But the trick is to go slow. So you could see that it's going to push itself along if you go that way. If you go against it, it does give you a little bit more control, but you will have to still go slow because if you start taking it a bit too much, a bit too heavy handed, it's going to gouge it. Sometimes that's fine because it's battle, it's weathering um, and, that, and that's fine. But just go a little bit slower until you kind of get the hang of it and you're going to give it a bit more confidence. Please excuse the fact that I'm dropping literally everything off the table. So I'm going to show you dremeling in these parts. So these would be softened on this edge here and on this edge here. And I'm not going to do this, but I will show you with the bigger dremel bit. So I've done this on my um, belt sander just because it's a lot quicker. And I drew a line so I had a guide where the center line is for the angle that I'm going to do it at but to show you in here. It's a little bit hard to do at this angle, so I, you have noticed I've taken a little bit for more off than I would like here. So I could either just sand that down or I could put a filler in it. Um, you can either use this because that is also sandable and it will bond to itself. And by this, I mean the foam clay. So it dries by air, so you need to make sure that the lid is kept on, but it is squishy like foam. Oh, sorry, like clay. And it feels like foam when it when it goes cool. Cool when it dries. Dries, you know what I mean. When it cures, whatever it does. And then you can patch it up. And then you would, once that has set, Tried, magicked, you would then go and just smooth that out with your sand, sander of whatever description you want to use. If you don't have a Dremel or can't afford a rotary tool, that's perfectly fine. You can still do this, of course. It's just going to take you a little bit longer. So for that, you would use sanding blocks and sanding sticks. You can even use like nail um, emery boards. So I have a variety of different sanding blocks. 
for little areas I usually will take a um, icy fold stick and I will cover it I will wrap my um, sandpaper and I will use that to go in on these really tight areas that I can't get in by hand and then for these other parts you can go in and literally just sand it it's going to take you a little bit longer but it can help just to give you that last little bit of smoothing and because this is a block it will make it nice and even because that is one of the challenges using a dremel because you're using such a small thing is that it can be a little bit wiggly so then you would just go back over it with your sander and smooth it out and it's as easy as that now you are going to get some little fuzzies you can see on these edges here got some fuzzy bits of foam now there's two things I'm going to show you one is the magic of scoring and adding heat so these areas I have scored into the foam so it's not all the way through it's just in the top and you would do this by hand by just doing it with your knife and you can just create a very light score going to try and do a little swirl. Hopefully it's very uneven. Even way here. I'm going to show you what happens when you add heat. So when I add heat to this edge, these little fuzzies will um, contract because it's going to remelt um, and shrink those cells. And when I add heat to this, it does the same sort of thing. So it is going to open up those score lines. So what should the magic happen? while I try not to drop everything off my workspace. You can see that has opened those little score lines right up. So that's how you get some really nice little detailing in, is just using your craft knife. And then I'll show you on this one. So this is a score line that I made as a guide and it's just lifted up on that score line. That is actually where this surface is adhered to the underneath surface. So I can just push that back down. And if it still is lifting, you can just apply a little bit of glue. So that is the craft foam layer. You can see the edge there. And then that's the base layer that is this. These little details look like that beforehand. And then when I add heat, they open up. And you also now notice that it has removed those fuzzies and it looks much smoother. What you would do next is that you would prime it. You would heat heat prime everything. So as I said, that really melts all everything. Um, once I would finish sanding, I would heat it all up again. I would make sure that it lays flat just to make sure that it doesn't bend because it is heat formable. And then I would hit it with a primer. That primer could either be something like PVA glue or Mod Podge or there is a Flexi Bond. Flexi Bond is good for movable parts that need some flex because it won't crack. Um, or you could use something like Peel Coat or the um, Plasti Dip which does have some flex. Do wear a mask with these, they are not very good for you. These are a little bit more expensive but they do have a nice effect um, and it is still a bit flexible. But you would do, so what you do is you apply several uh, thin coats to build up that primer layer and it will be the same as this. So what I generally do is dilute this down because if you apply that straight onto the surface, it's pretty, it's like PVA, it's pretty gooby um, and you can end up with some streaks from where you've applied it. So if you um, dilute it just a little bit, it just thins it out a bit. You don't want it too thin because it will just soak straight into the foam. But if you have a little bit of water, it just allows you to smooth it a sort of self level level. And then you would then put another primer on top and then you'll paint it. And that's how you would do these little details. I've done it just really quickly just to show you, but you can already see here, this handle part here is just softened that edge compared to here. Also allows me to even up these edges here where there's a little bit of an overhang. 
um, and then you just soften everything. And the good thing as well is like the these drums kind of nicely go into those curves, which makes life a little bit easier. So that is using the Dremel to do that. So generally I will go over all of my edges with my Dremel. I would take these back. I would go in here with it. And then if I wanted to do more detailing, I would use um, the little tip to add my little rivets. And that's it. This fan brace that I designed is based for my partner. So I sketched out some things of what he wanted. Now he wanted to wear it for um, his band, he's a drummer. So an important consideration that I had to make is that he has mobility, <laughs> that there's nothing restricting his wrist and uh, elbow movements, and that he has full range of doing that. So that means that I wouldn't have a piece that has obviously something extending past the hand, and I'm not gonna have anything that cuts into low here, because it'll butt in the way, or it'll just end up creasing up. I'm not gonna have anything extending up too high either. So nothing fancy there so we're going to have a little bit shorter than what you might see some more traditional braces and then i'm going to have some little detail parts that um, sort of fit him and his theme and some of the feedback that he gave me or what he would like so these were some preliminary sketches and i make notes for myself as well the importance of doing notes is i usually won't remember if i come back to a build i don't always do a build all in one sitting um, and my memory is shocking. So having these notes helps me later on down the track to go, what was I thinking? But also say you're doing um, a group or you're creating patterns for other people to follow, those notes are gonna be really helpful <laughs> for everyone else to follow as well. So I knew that I wanted to use a raven skull. So I actually had a mold already of a raven skull. Um, that's something that's important to my partner. It's part of like a symbol that represents him a little bit. So I was able to use the foam clay to create some raven skulls and you can see it's actually um, taken up the detail fairly nicely. What will happen is that you will lose some of the detail as it uh, sets um, compared to like if you were doing a resin, resin cast. But the benefit is one, it's a lot cheaper than resin, two, it um, can be a bit quicker than resin depending on the um, type of resin that you get um, but you still do need to wait a little bit depending on how thick your piece is if you're doing very thick um, sculpts with this it can take ages for the center part to dry but basically what you would do is you take your piece you're going to smush it into the mold and you're going to make sure that there's no air bubbles so you're going to really get it in there and that's way too much the good thing is I can reuse that by just chucking it back in, which I will do later because I can't open. I'll smush that in there. Now, if I let that sit in there to try and cure it, it's not really going to because it needs the air because it's air dry. But if I take it out now, I will show you what will happen. it's still squishy it's going to distort as soon as you take it out um, you'd have to be like pretty magic to get it out without distorting I mean it might work if you're doing like kind of look like from Beetlejuice when you wear the mask thing um, so that's not good <laughs> it's not very helpful so what you do with this is that you'll put it in your mold and then you'll put your mold in the freezer and you let it sit there for a little bit um, once it's kind of firmed up a little bit, then you can take it out of the mold. Don't leave it in the mold. What will happen is you'll get some condensation forming on the piece. And if it's still sitting in there, that's sort of trapped on the surface and it makes the surface look kind of crappy, but it also still won't cure properly. So you pop it in the freezer, that firms it up enough for you to take it out and then you would let it sit um, and do its thing. And there's bits of resin stuck to it. <laughs> Um, and you will lose a little bit of detailing. So what you could do is if you've lost some detail while, while it's come out and it's not fully cured, you could go in again with like your tools, like even if it's just a little skewer or your um, sculpting tools and just go in a little bit more just to deepen those up because same as like this foam, um, it will start to spring back a little bit. 
So that is one of the things, but you could still um, sculpt directly onto the foam itself and build up something directly on there if you wanted to do that. But it's very light. Just give yourself a little bit of time for it to fully cure and make sure that it's sealed well. So I had that, so I knew that I wanted to use that. And then I wanted to create these little spikes. So these sit raised up and they um, sort of stack. Again, I don't want it extending too high up, but I wanted enough that it sort of felt balanced. And then I sort of went, do I want an edge? For the purposes of this, I couldn't be bothered. <laughs> um, but you could create like more detail on it. So you could build upon that to do more. Um, and then with the closures, I was wondering like, do I do a strap? But I'm actually gonna do grommets or I'm gonna fake doing grommets um, so that it would be a lace up, um, like a more traditional letter style. So from that sketch, he went, yep, yeah, cool, I want that. So I kind of sketched up. So these are my little spiky bits so that I can kind of get an idea. I wanted my spiky bit to sort of do what this does, where it would rest up like that a bit. So I had to think about how is that gonna lay, lay on, on that piece. And to do that little shape, I knew that I would have to score it. The next thing that I did was I made a pattern from his arm. So this is a tried and true technique of many cosplayers and it is very effective and it's also a very handy trick if you do commissions because you don't always have access to your client. So what you do is you create a pattern from them. So basically all you're doing is you're getting yourself ladder and some tape some tape and you could use either masking tape or duct tape um, the problem with masking tape is it starts to deteriorate over time and it will end up looking like this <laughs> so it's a bit sad and it's lost its stickiness so because I already patterned from this and it wasn't sitting there for too long that was fine but that's what will happen to masking tape as a heads up Whereas duct tape doesn't do that. Duct tape does have a little bit of stretch to it as well. So that's why that works quite well. And if you're going to do, especially over curves using masking tape, you just do short strips and you want to overlay them um, across the shape to kind of give you that dimensionality. So I wrapped off his arm in glad wrap. I covered the area that I wanted in duct tape. And then I took my, my Sharpie and I sketched out where I wanted it. From that, I kind of have a basic pattern. Still not perfect, but I then take my, this is my go-to. It's just, it's just baking paper. Just use really cheap baking paper. Don't use cheap baking paper for thermoplastics though. So what I, do, uh, what I like to do when I'm um, working with thermoplastics is it tends to, when you hit it, it'll stick. So I put it on baking paper because then I can peel it straight off. But don't use the cheap baking paper for the warbler because it will stick to it. Um, but this is really handy for doing patterning. I use it a lot because it's cheap. Um, and also, it's transparent. You could also use um, tracing paper, but this is cheaper. So from that, <clears throat> I overlay onto my sheet and I'm gonna start sketching out the rough dimensions. And then because it's symmetrical, I get one side right and I am always checking it. So once I do a rough, I take that rough and I go and check it on my, my person um, and make sure, yeah, is it sitting where I, is it far enough along where I want it? Is it too far? Is it too short? And then I make the adjustments on my baking paper. And then once I'm happy with it, I'll cut it out. To cut it out, because it's symmetrical, fold it in half along your center line, because you know where your center line is going to be. Fold it in half, cut it out. That way, you know, bang, it is 100% symmetrical. <laughs> because otherwise I'm not very good at getting my curve. As you can see here, my curve's a bit wonky. So there's your pattern. Because I knew what I wanted on it already, so I sat my piece on it and I had to work out this shape. So I sketched the shapes on there and then from there I could sort of do a mock-up and I'm placing them along just to check that they fit. 
One thing to consider as well is remember that this is going to be curved. It's not going to be flat laying. It's going to be curved. The piece that sits on it, which is going to look like this, is also going to curve because that's helping us get that shape. So you also need to um, take into consideration that that is going to be like that. So when you make your pattern from that, if you cut it into that shape, it is going to probably be even smaller because you're pulling it in. So you just need to account for that. So that's why I make mock-ups out of just my craft foam because it's cheap. It simulates the material I'm working with. If I'm working with leather as well, I will often use um, craft foam because the craft foam is a very, it has very similar properties and it's far cheaper <laughs> than working with leather. So from that, I was able to trace that onto, onto my foam and I made a basic pattern and I just tested it to make sure that it fit how I wanted it to. I knew to account a little bit, so I would do a test fit. Now, one of the things that I like about foam as well is that you can use pins to hold everything together. So I took my pattern, I checked that it all fit right, and I traced it onto my foam, and that gives us our band brace shape. Now, there are patterns available. Um, you can get ones from like Spotlight that have, um, there are patterns for like leather van brace and stuff. It is essentially the same thing. Um, and there are ones that are online available as well. But for this, it didn't need to be that complicated. So it worked perfectly fine. So I'm gonna use my dummy arm. Say hi. Hi. And he's going to be my dummy arm. Please excuse the mess of it. It's been sitting in the garage for a while. This dummy's arms are very long and they're very skinny. <laughs> um, so what I would tend to do is I've actually made like, uh, like a duct tape dummy of an arm for the person that I was working on. Um, and it's the same, exactly the same as when you're doing something like that, but you're just doing it all the way and then you're putting stuffing inside it. So that way you've always got um, sort of like a mannequin to work off. But this gives me something to make sure that the fit is okay. So you can use pins on foam, particularly because this is my mock-up piece. And all you do is you just stick your pins in. You do just have to remember that if you do go sticking pins in a lot of um, your final foam, that you might just need to fill it a little bit more when you do your priming layer so that you're not having still holes sitting in. Um, so you just need to do, um, build, build your layers up of your primer. So that you're filling them in or you might do like a base layer of like a slightly thicker like if you were using the mod podge you would do it like less diluted for that first layer just to help even that out so now i've got his arm is a bit ridiculous sorry sorry buddy but his arms you need to do some work you need to work out a little bit because it's very tubular <laughs> but for this it's fine so i knew that this i had to have sitting about here I also have cat hair on everything, so please excuse all the cat hair. So I'm going to put my raven here, and I'm going to take my mock up, and I'm going to put that there. And I'm going to check that I'm happy with how that's sitting. And then I do the same thing, and I pin these guys in place. I'm going to pretend that I'm doing it straight because I can't really see what I'm doing. So just pretend. If it's not, just. So this piece is going to be done in that similar way that I showed you with creating those little rifts and valleys. So you're going to put an adhesive. Now see how there's that poking up? I don't want it to do that, but I want it to anchor a little bit more. Also please excuse the fact that you can hear my cat sitting outside the door wanting um, food and attention. And then I, would, I made a few more of those just to make sure that I was happy with how that was sitting. Now it's my hair on it. It's really static. This stuff's really static, so yeah. And then I'm building that up like that. You can use tape as well. I will usually, um, I'm not obviously going to stick pins into my client <laughs> or myself um, so I will use just tape like masking tape is fine um, double check some foams when you tape them 
they will um, not come. The tape kind of takes some of the foam off with it. Um, so that is not ideal. Um, so just do a small test. Your craft foam, it can tape. Um, and also if you leave it on there for an extended period of time, sometimes that can also start to eat away a little bit of the foam. So just um, check it first. So then I'm going to take my pattern and I'm going to overlay it. And here I will either put weights on it or I will um, pin it. I'm just going to trace this. I like to try and make use as much as possible of the material so they don't have as much waste and don't throw away like all the pieces because you can use them like these are the holes from the the knife I can use them as like plugs on a costume or something like that or you can cut them in half they come in handy obviously don't hoard your pieces but they still come in handy Now I've got my base of the van brace, which would sit like that once we heat it. The next thing you need to do is take, I have a master one of these, which is that one. Here's my pattern. And I take my foam that I need to put down here. And now the reason that I'm making three new pieces and not using this and then tracing two is I'll show you what happens is because if you're tracing this one remember that your pen is going to go along the edge so these pieces will invariably not end up being exactly the same size so if I use that as a pattern and do that for all three those three should stay the same size unless I'm very terrible at cutting out and the other thing you can do the same trick as you did with um, the pattern and just fold it in half and cut it that way you just have to be very sure that your pieces are lined up correctly so I've laced it up in a similar fashion to this one this is the lacing that I would prefer to use but I don't have any left um, and this is a van brace that I made very early on and it's out of leather but this looks not half bad right isn't quite the lacing that I would like to use I would prefer that but we make do with what we have <laughs> but I think it still gives you an idea I did a bit of cleaning up so I just softened the edges here I sanded back the glue that was there the next thing that you would do is what you would just prime it so you would seal the foam I've done a heat seal already and I would use either the Mod Podge or something like the peel coat or the plaster dip and you do a few layers of that it will take you a little bit to, um, to, to layer up and then once you've done that, you're good to add your paint, whether you want to give it a nice matte finish like this so it gives a simulation of leather, or perhaps you want to make it a little bit more rustic. You can add your highlights, a bit of um, rub and buff or acrylic paint, um, and you're good to go. So that wasn't terribly difficult. You can bang that out pretty quickly, but hopefully you've learned at least the basics to get you started with some confidence. Come join our COS family. And I hope to see you at our next convention. Thanks so much for joining me. Bye.